The Chef and Foundation's Hero Highlights Stories from the Field is presented by Danone North America. Today, we will be presenting the second part of a two-part interview with Omar Guevara Soto, Assistant Director of the Minneapolis Public Schools Culinary and Wellness Services in Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you are looking for support during this coronavirus pandemic, please head over to our COVID-19 resources and support page. And if you'd like to nominate a school food leader in your community for Hero Highlights, please send an email to submissions at chefandfoundation.org. Can you briefly summarize your emergency feeding program, how you operated? Oh, of course. Our central facility is a production kitchen, and right now they are. So I'll tell, give you the overview from the production kitchen out, how the food ends in, in the box and everything. So the whole, um, our entire facility was suddenly sectioned, and we have a production team that is the one that continues to create the meals. We pack them in house, and then there is a box production team where they are actually putting together the boxes that we're giving. Um, we have um, we have uh, you know throughout the city we have we tackle all areas of the city mm -hmm. in different days, and from ten to two families stop by. And we, we provide them with a box per child and, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, hopefully that, that gets them through the week and next week we do the same thing. Mm. Is that what you asked for? Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you have 10 sites. Are you, um, having families come to those sites and pick up the boxes? Uh, that or, is correct. are you doing drop offs? Okay, great. That is correct. We do have the service for delivery. If, you know, if a family, if their location there is not within the half a mile distance, mm -hmm. uh, a pickup location, we, we look, we, um, you know, select the locations based on that, thinking about that, right? How to make it easy for, for people to, to walk to make sure that they have access to the food in different days. So mm -hmm. if you live in an area where maybe grocery stores are not as popular or are non-existent, for sure you have throughout the week at least four sites within a radius of mm -hmm. one, half a mile, one mile, where you can go and get access to food. Mm -hmm. If that is an impediment, they can request a home delivery and we will, we are doing it all for the, you know, if we have, we have been able to actually support the students with, um, special dietary needs. Mm -hmm. And, um, we have all on file what they need and we're providing whether it is a gluten-free box and, you know, special yeah. delivered to their home. Yeah. Awesome. And, Throughout the week, we touch 50 different sites throughout the city. So oh, okay. it, is, it, is, um, it is easy for a family to actually look at the map. And if it's not Monday, for sure, Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, there is a location next home, close to home to go and get, and get food. The next question is a big one. How is your team handling the re recent protests and attention specifically on Minneapolis surrounding race and racial justice? It is a big one, right? Um, Minneapolis, again, became the epicenter of despair. I must give recognition to our staff, you know, because when there's a crisis, any and I dare to say every school food service department, instead of retrieve, they take a step forward and they step in, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Proven right now, you see majority of the school districts, uh, their school food service departments, they are, are doing what they can to continue their feeding programs. 
Um, and this time for us was a double whammy, you know, like suddenly we had, we were, we were in the middle of a pandemic and, and this really sad um, and horrible situation of the murder of George Floyd happened. It was a pretty, pretty emotional moment the morning after when we had to gather and we had to have that conversation and we had to explain and talk it over that, that we needed to still go out. We needed to be there for the community. And the big ask for, we have an every morning kind of a little check-in meeting debrief to go over what's going on for the day. We talk about the weather, we give kudos, we to, you know, we go over the numbers from the day before and what we should be doing. That day it was a, a lot of, of silence. Um, as of today, I am seeing, you know, how everyone is dealing with their own learning and unlearning, how people are listening and others are speaking, um, and how that energy is still is present within our team. Um, we all ask that today was a, an, a soft today. It's a moment of deep listening. We need to, we ask for people to try to avoid making judgments. Um, we try, we, we are, we're in a transition period that is, um, that is, you know, completely dominated by pain. Um, so these conversations are sometimes light, sometimes really heavy, but what you see is a group of people that still go out, that are taking the opportunity to connect with the community, to see their regulars, as we call them, when they go and pick up the boxes. And we are encouraging people to actually, um, if there is a conversation that they are engaged, to make sure that, that we're taking the opportunity to deliver the right message, that, that, that it is okay to just be quiet and listen, and also it is okay to share how you're feeling. We, we cannot express enough that we, it is a time more than ever where we need everyone to be kind to one another. And it feels a little, a little incomplete or, or wrong to say right now to respect, to put aside each other's differences. I think it is now moment to actually confront those differences and put them in the center of what we're doing because we need to understand those differences. And that is part of the learning of who you are, who, how you've been coded um, on one, one side or the other and to start learning what you need to learn. And hopefully that's for your own benefit to show the other human being that you care for them. And also to keep in mind that we work with youth and that they are looking up to us. So our staff, they definitely, they're definitely wanting to have this, this conversation more in depth. Um, I feel that they are, they're letting a little bit of space to, to really address it. And we have had some requests from our staff on like, how do we, how do we make the air lighter, right? Mm. So um, we're working through it. We are, we're seeing what's happening and, and we're listening really hard. Um, in, and trying to learn what is source, like how do we 
where do we fit into this conversation to, to, to bring a little bit of, you know, to let people grieve, to give a little, little bring a little bit of comfort, mm. if, if that is possible at all, you know. Do you think that these conversations affect how you have conversations or how you think about food equity as a team and as a community? It does. It does. The next day, the Southeast area where the precinct was where all the fires happened, you know, a Target, an Aldi, a Cup Foods, burned, looted, looted um, and closed. The consequence of that was suddenly a huge area with that turned overnight again into a food desert, right? And I do believe school food could be at the forefront of uh, addressing, you know, uh, completely the, the food justice landscape. Mm -hmm. Because um, we have, we potentially could be positioned to be, to be a sustainable and safe um, and super important, a consistent source of food access to everyone. So mm. right away, what we did, we, we increased the number of sites um, within the area that of the most affected area of our city. And, and we noticed, we heard, we saw people really, really stepping up and, and helping that area because the, the food access was completely shut down with this. And all those families, you know, that area is, is a very diverse area, heavy Latino population. Um, people that depend, uh, like heavy area where transport, public transportation is a, is a must and public transportation was shut down for days. So all these areas, and, and again, we were able to actually step in and step forward and help and, and, and create more access for all of, for food. You rephrase, you answered my next question word for word in how you position school food in the larger food justice landscape. And I think it's so um, poignant the way that you said it and, and how you responded when you saw that food deserts were literally created due to action. And then you, you counter, countered that with action to support those areas that needed it. Major, talk about kudos, major kudos. Thank um, you. Are you noticing any changes in your program participation due to the protests and the unemployment? Um, I know you said that you saw that huge increase. Has it been in sustained? Um, and you know, it was sustained, and um, we are seeing, um, as I said, the society, a lot of groups step up, and today they are food drives. They are. They are, you know, people are, are helping them, each other. And, and definitely that has affected a little bit of the participation because right now, you know, not only school food services, it's everyone, all hands on deck in our society helping where there is need. Um, also, you know, when the Minnesota ABT fund release happened, we saw a little bit of a, of a, of a decrease in our participation, but it has been very steady on the average of 42, 44,000 meals um, distributed every day. Um, I do think that everything is coming together, the end of the school year, the beginning of the summer, the, you know, people starting to go back to work here in Minnesota, things opening up um, a little bit. So that's, the, you know, the schedule that we have for families that were either for load or working from home now that they've been asked to actually go back to work, um, it's not realistic anymore that that is the best schedule in the time of the day to pick up food. So there are a list of factors that we are considering and we're observing closely. 
And we're seeing how that, that is affecting and when. And mm -hmm. that is part of how we are actually kind of streamlining uh, how we're going to be moving forward, con taking under consideration this, this list of factors that we, that we daily learn. Mm. So I, my prediction is that it will not, it will, it will go back to be uh, in, the, in the same level once people again learn a new routine, a new, you know, their new schedule. A new yeah. normal. A new normal, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so on that note of a new normal, what do you anticipate your school lunch program looking like in the fall? Uh, have you, has your district made any decisions yet regarding in-class in class versus home learning? Um, and how do you think yeah. that will affect your department? Yeah. Um, our leadership in the district, they are, they're, they're working hard. And I am witnessing that firsthand. They are thinking super hard. We, they have, they are looking, obviously we are under the guidance and we're expecting guidance from the governor's office on how this is going to happen, right? Yeah. Minnesota has the dial to, you know, relax all the stay home rules and, and regulations on for safety regulations for COVID and everything. They're starting to come out. Um, but I know we, we have three scenarios that every school district in Minnesota is looking, it has been asked to be looked at. Um, the information as it comes is shared with us. So we are starting this huge process, thinking process on if plan A goes, how does it look, what, you know, what do we need to do for plan A, for plan B, for plan C. So when we are ready, um, or when we're, when we're asked and given the green light that it's a go, we could actually jump into action. And we are carefully trying to just cover the, you know, the basics so we can actually, once we are in, we can start the process of, of improving. How do, we, how do we walk back to be, you know, to continue providing, uh, to increase in access to food to every student in the Minneapolis public schools? How do we live true to what we consider or we have branded ourselves as true food, um, you know, district? So, we're trying to engage all this in also um, learning through training on COVID and how to prevent, how to keep safe our staff and in order for staff to keep safe our students. So it's a huge process. It's, um, you know, I'm, not everybody loves or enjoys living on the unknown and in the gray. And this is, a huge gray that uh, it is, you know, it's a huge challenge. It's a really good challenge to, to be in mm. not the best conditions, but mm. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Hmm. I can only imagine. And <laughs> I, 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 I think it's very incredible to have all those different plans and to, to know, okay, now we can go on B, you know, and you, I, I feel like I might be somebody who would be more attached to one versus the other and have a hard time letting the other go. <laughs> but that's just a me thing. I think. Right. And B might turn into B1, B2 or B3 with a little <laughs> bit of A and yeah. two thirds of C. So <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Uh, can you just reiterate any feedback you've heard from community um, since you started the remote feeding? Uh, you know, if there's anything else you can expand upon other than the, uh, the big hit of the tamale boxes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, you know, um, it has been pretty positive feedback. Um, some parents say that it is like quickly like opening a gift box 
for their kids. Yeah, that's it is a great activity to go pick up the box, come back home and open it and, you know, sort the food, plan their meals for the week, Mm -hmm. see the heating instructions for those who are who are who have access to their Facebook and there's a Facebook page where where we actually put videos on how to heat up the food. Um, um, the variety, the amount of fresh food that we are providing in these boxes. Mm-hmm. Um, our nutrition center, or the, you know, Chef Mark Agustin, he has, he has been polishing the contents of those, uh, in those boxes as of also thinking, what is that? what are the repercussions of having all this packaging in there, right? So he has been working on, you know, making sure that it is not seven little baggies of broccoli, like they're receiving the, the right amount of broccoli in a one package, the fruit, the amount of fresh fruit. Mm. Um, we have, uh, you know, the, um, the asks from, from families of, you know, of what to do on how to mix the food. There is, there has been creation of other Facebook pages from parents where they are sharing like, hey, what do you do with all the milk that you're getting? And people are making yogurt or people are actually- Oh, that's awesome. Cre- you know, creating, um, there's, um, there's a Dowling School Facebook parent page where actually there is a family that has organized a little drive within the, the neighborhood to distribute milk to whoever needs it or really drinks it. And like, there, there is a lot of action around it. Um, I, you know, I personally, I am so proud of what, or, of the contents of the box and, on the on how positive the, the, um, the you know our community has reacted to the content, and um, overall, I am very I'm very pleased to see the feedback and the kudos and the recognitions coming directly to the people that are making it happen. That's that's the best that you know that could happen for all of us. And so well-deserved. Thanks. Um, As an organization and and as individuals that may be listening to this, how can we support the work that you are doing? Hmm. We need to make sure that people know, you know, that they remember that, you know, the awesome work that all these, that everyone involved in school food service do, but not only during emergencies, like year round, That's you right. know, at schools, um, like salad bars, the, the work that every food service coordinator and cook and assistant, the work they do, the, um, you know, everything they put together to actually provide meals to, to every student that goes into the school and the quality of meals that people put out there. Um, they need to, I think, what I would like, if anybody who's listening, I just would like to, for them to keep this in mind and to thank them for their support, you know, to, to, Thank them for their partnership, for those that are sending their kids down to the lunchroom through the lines and, and making sure that they, that they partake of the meals that we put out. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And for those that are recently joining us and considering, don't doubt about it. Open a, a school account and, ask, and make sure your kid eats breakfast, lunch, and takes a snack. You know? Welcome. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> join us. <laughs> yes. Join us. Awesome. Is there anything that you want the broader audience to know about the program, your work or 
some current circumstances? Um, yeah, um, I don't, there's, um, we're here, um, we're here for the community. We, you know, we're really proud of what we do. And I hope once we are back in school, you know, we can keep up with this and you know work on ending that stigma of what school lunch is or that's school right. food that's right you know it is food in the schools we we serve good food in the schools and and people need to know that and for any youth uh you know our hope is that they they can continue getting access to fresh food, learning about food, where the food comes from, how is how did it, the food end up in their plate, and hopefully they can grow to make on their own decisions of what is put in their fork and from their fork to their mouth. That you know, that action that we are so uh, coded, so used to just put you know, put something in the form of putting in your mouth that people actually start, you know, being thoughtful about what's happening in that natural action that we all know as eating, you know, like put the thought in it, what's going from your plate into your body. That mindfulness is so important. Um, Omar, thank you so much for chatting with us today. You truly are an inspiration, and I'm so glad that we get to feature you on this Hero Highlights. Um, thank you, Asa. Thank you um, for reaching out. It's awesome. Yeah. And thank you to, um, to Chef Ann Foundation for everything you guys do for us. We love the partnership. Yes. Yes. And so do we. And we are so excited to continue building on that. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you. And um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you for tuning into the second part of our two-part interview with Omar. If you missed the first half, please check it out on the lunch line at chefandfoundation.org. Just as a reminder, if you have anyone you think should be featured on this Hero Highlights series, please send an email to submissions at chefandfoundation.org. Hero Highlights is a program of the Chef Ann Foundation, who carries out our vision by ensuring that school food professionals have the resources, funding, and support they need to provide fresh, healthy, delicious, cooked-from-scratch meals that support the health of children and our planet. The Hero Highlights series is sponsored by Danone North America, who offers a variety of brands that kids and parents love, including Danon, Silk, Horizon, Organic, and many more. The company's mission is to bring health through food to as many people as possible, and they greatly value their partnership with the Chef Ann Foundation to bring this vision to life within K-12 food service. Learn more at DanoneAwayFromHome.com. If you'd like to check out any of the other heroes we have highlighted, please head over to the lunch line at ChefAnnFoundation.org. Thank you, and I hope you have a great day.